Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's podcast. As you would imagine, I have to start out by thanking Ronnie for stepping in last week. He did an amazing job, and I'm starting to realize that every one of the guest people who have come in and shot the podcast have a better speaking voice than I do. <laughs> I mean, I was used to that in the band days because I could just then go play guitar and not have to worry about how bad my singing voice was, but damn everybody like crack your voice once or twice to make me feel better or something <laughs> but anyway thanks very much to ronnie for filling in and let's jump into what's going on this week first up is a brand new scart switch from the company games care and i think the post in its current form as i'm recording this i think i got a few details off i'm waiting to hear back from the company but by the time you hear or see this the post will probably be cleaned up so what i believe this is is a module scart switch that you could buy in either 4x2, 8x2, or up to 16x2. And uh, the, the main version, the red side, if you're watching on video, is a 4x2 switch with four SCART inputs, one SCART and one D sub output. And then the back of it just has connectors that allows you to keep adding on these extra modules up until you get to about 16 inputs. So this is a really cool idea. And I think the eight by two version is gonna be priced for around 170, which means that now there's options that are really on all levels of the pricing spectrum. So, um, you know, the Otaku switch is the most basic one that I found that's a push button switch that in my testing worked perfectly fine. Uh, then we have the different versions of this. And then of course you get the G-SCART with the sync regeneration and all those awesome features on it. So I think, th we're, it's it's really awesome that we have so many great choices now. But another very cool thing about this is for anybody that's unaware, uh, anytime you try to get something that's not made in Brazil sent to Brazil, the import taxes on it are pretty crazy. And I'm not like bashing Brazil or anything. <laughs> you know, I just, it is what it is. You know, I'm not saying good or bad. It's just, it is, it's just the way it is. Um, and anybody that's interested could look up some pretty crazy stuff online, like how much it would cost to get a PS4 over there, how much it costs to get, you know, even like a Nintendo Switch, I think is more than double the price because of these things. So the fact that there's a Switch that's um, available in Brazil, made, uh, made in Brazil, that means that whoever lives there could just buy it for the 170 plus local shipping, as opposed to paying for international shipping, and on top of that, whatever the crazy import tax might be. So this is pretty awesome, and I also love how, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to see uh, very publicly recently the difference between um, being inspired by a product, uh, you know, parallel thinking, two people come up with the same idea at the same time but don't know each other, and outright cloning. And to me, who's not an electrical engineer, this looks like a product that was designed completely from scratch. Uh, and, you know, of course, you know, anything that's made today is going to be inspired by the other stuff that's out there. But this this looks like a, a good design that's that was built from scratch from people. So it's uh, it's really awesome to see all of these things. You know, this is one of those posts that I love everything about it, except the mistakes I made in the post. So uh, if you're in Brazil, without a doubt, take a look at Games Care. I believe they're only available for purchase on their Facebook page now, but a, a, a more normal storefront will be appearing soon. Um, and if you're outside of Brazil, I, you know, take a look anyway. Maybe this is the exact thing that you were waiting for. Maybe this fits your needs better than some of the other choices. Um, but honestly, I love that there's more choices, and I love that people stepped up to the plate to uh, to fix the problem of how to get stuff in Brazil when it comes to SCART switches. So uh, it's pretty cool. I hope a lot of people in Brazil take advantage of the open source designs that's out there as well. Um, because even small, cheap things would be incredibly expensive to import in. So uh, I know for a fact there's some really amazing quality manufacturing facilities in Brazil. I have, uh, you know, in a past life, other companies have worked uh, with people down there. So um, maybe this is the start of a, a whole lot more things like this so that people could have access to some of the cooler stuff that we all do without having to pay for such insane import taxes and shipping and stuff. So awesome job, Games Care. Hopefully I'll be able to, uh, to take a look at one of these in person one day, but so far it looks like you're getting it right. Ben Abrish just posted a picture of a Nintendo Power magazine that he found with a section in it called How to Play It Loud. And uh, this really kind of made me chuckle for a few reasons. First of all, anybody that grew up in that era remembers the Sega versus Nintendo and how Sega posed themselves as the, you know, the cool kids and Nintendo was for children. So Nintendo's Play It Loud campaign was, was to try to be like 
I don't know. I, whatever that they were trying, I was the demographic at that age, and it didn't work, I'll tell you that much. I still loved the games, but I still didn't think uh, they were suddenly badass because they were telling people to play it loud. But one of the things that, uh, that really stuck out to me about this um, was that it says if you have a Super VHS input, or S-Video as we now call it today, uh, to use that to get a better picture. And that really hit me because of how many people have tried to tell me that I'm supposed to be playing these games in composite video because Nintendo and Sega wanted us to only use composite video and anything other than composites the wrong way to play it. My answer to them is the right way to play it is whatever is the best for you. Uh, and anybody that tells you you could only play it one way is a complete ass and should be ignored. I just found this really funny because now it's kind of like proof that Nintendo themselves said, play it in the best quality you possibly can. And if you're uh, if you're in PAL land, um, or I guess in Japan as well, uh, if they had any magazine articles like this that had like pictures of SCART inputs and tries to, to tell you to play it in RGB, I guess it would be around the same time. Time, uh, please send them to me and um, I'll see if Ben would add it to the post because I think it's just really, really funny to me. Um, but once again, it's just another reminder that there's different ways to play stuff and Nintendo themselves have even uh, have even embraced it. So thanks, Ben, for posting this one and giving me a, a pretty good chuckle. And now anytime anybody here gets shamed by one of the internet weirdos that says you can't use RGB, you could uh, just reference this picture and remind them that even Nintendo said play it as loudly as you possibly can. The Dreamcast game Napple Tale has just gotten an English translation, and this is a pretty interesting game because it came out in a strange time where I guess most people out of Japan, um, the game companies might have thought that we weren't really interested in a 2.5D adventure game, so they only released it in Japan. I believe they called it a role-playing game, um, and it's it's kind of unique and it's certainly something that I'd be interested in checking out. In fact, I remember when Jimmy Hoppe did a video on this a few years ago. Uh, it was something I was very interested in, but not being able to read Japanese, I never gave it a shot. Uh, so now that there is an English translation available, I definitely want to give it a try. And although I say this all the time, thank you so much to everybody who does these language translations. Whatever language you're coming from and whatever language you're going to, I know it's grown worthy every time I say this, but I do enjoy seeing the world become a smaller place and people to be able to just experience fun games that they wouldn't have been able to before. So whether it's deep and intense translations like this one, or heck, just the people that translated Afterburner, I think that's all pretty awesome. So thanks so much for the whole team of people that did that. Uh, and if you want to check out a pretty unique 2.5D action-adventure game for the Dreamcast, maybe now you can give Napple Tail a shot. The company Retro Fighters has just posted a Kickstarter update regarding their Dreamcast controllers, and it looks like they got some of the prototypes in, and they need to do a, a few tweaks on it to make it up to their quality standards, but they're targeting late December, early January to deliver to Kickstarter backers, with mass production coming soon after that. So uh, it looks like a cool controller. I'm certainly interested in trying it out myself, but I don't think I have any real time spent with Retro Fighters controllers, and I'm kind of interested to see any anybody that feels like commenting what experience you all have had with it because anytime there's a new controller especially anything you know any kind of thing that involves adapters and anything like that i'm always wondering how they built the circuit boards and if there's any latency added so if this is a controller designed specifically for the dreamcast standard and you know it should be equal latency as the original but if it's like a generic controller with just a conversion circuit in there, then there might be some delay in converting the button presses to the Dreamcast signal. So I don't know any of that. Um, it's just I wouldn't be me if I didn't ask. <laughs> so uh, please post and, and let me know your thoughts on Retro Fighters controllers. Are they good third party? Um, are they good, reliable build quality? The few moments I've seen them, they looked pretty cool, but I certainly didn't spend enough time with them to, to really have any solid opinions on them either way so kind of interested maybe one of these days i'll just set time aside and do some testing on them i have a bit of mixed emotions about this next post but i'm also really hoping that you all might be able to help with this one kevin mellett has just announced two things First, his Multiboy 32, the flash cart that's more of a standard ROM cart for the Virtual Boy, has been delayed, but he's now opened pre-orders for what he's calling the Hyper Flash 32, which is a single flash ROM cart 
that's really meant to just fill the time between now and when the Multi Boy 32 was out. Um, originally, there was a cart called the Flash Boy Plus made by somebody named Richard Hutchinson, which was an awesome single flash cart, but he no longer makes them. So I think Kevin stepped up to fill the void and Virtual Boy ROM carts for now, and the one that is open for pre-orders does have a few extra features than the Flash Boy does, in that it should be a little bit easier to use a software interface. Sometimes the Flash Boy one got a little bit clunky with me. When it worked, it worked perfect, but sometimes there's reboots and stuff involved. Uh, also, it does support save games, which is pretty awesome, and something that I was always shocked the Flash Boy didn't support. So um, on the Flash Boy, you, could, you would be able to save your game, but you couldn't dump or transfer those saves. So now on this new Hyper Flash 32, you'd be able to back up your saves and restore them if you reload that game, which is pretty awesome. So it gets one step closer to a real ROM cart. Um, and this could also flash much higher sized games, meaning Hyper Fighting can now be dumped on it, which before on the Flash Boy, you could only have the demo. You couldn't play the full game. So overall, it's pretty good, but the main reason that the multi-boy was delayed, um, well, one, of, one of the main reasons is that the connector at the end of a Virtual Boy cons cartridge uh, isn't available anywhere else at the moment. So right now, in order to make these Hyper Flash 32s, Kevin's requiring donor carts, which essentially means you got to cannibalize Virtual Boy games. And, you know, while the ones that are for a dollar at the bottom of a bin don't really bother me, I would like to not have to cannibalize anything. And, of course, with 3D printing, the cases aren't that big a deal. But does anybody know where we can get connectors for them? And if you don't, is there anybody that's willing to work work with everybody in the Virtual Boy scene and make enough for all future projects? You know, I do realize there's a minimum order and somebody has to take a risk, which sucks, but... You know, this is just one of those things where there'd be probably more homebrew available if you didn't have to use a donor cartridge. Uh, I know a lot of collectors out there really like buying the physical homebrew games that are available. For me personally, I like just my own opinion. I like to support the developers by PayPaling them, but just using the ROM. Uh, but that's kind of a big deal for a lot of collectors and also for anybody that wants to make flash carts and stuff like this. So... Uh, I guess for the short term, if anybody knows how to figure out how to get the connectors for the Virtual Boy, please contact any one of us, myself, Kevin, anybody in the Virtual Boy forums, we'll all be able to, to figure it all out. Um, and also, if anybody wants to buy one of these now, uh, it's about 135 plus shipping if you supply your own donor cart. And it was 150 plus shipping if you're buying everything from Kevin, but I think he's running out of donor carts even, which is another sign that we really, really need those cartridge connectors. So while I'm sad we don't have just a straight up uh, ROM cart for the Virtual Boy, the delays will probably mean the if uh, when that eventually comes out, we'll be able to have it completely made from scratch, no donor parts, um, and who knows, maybe Kevin will figure out some extra neat features to throw in with the extra time that he has on it, but... Uh, I'm really looking forward to testing out the Hyper Flash. Kind of want to see how it performs and how certain games, how easy it is to load games on it. But hopefully, we could all get those connectors and get the multi boy eventually. A Kickstarter is now live for a brand new Neo Geo shooter called Project Neon, and the game looks pretty neat. It's about $300 if you just want the basic MVS or AES editions, and it's under $400 if you want the collector's editions. Uh, and even though I don't consider myself a collector, I think if I'm going to spend that much money on a pretty cool game, I would probably want the collector's edition. Um, but as always, I'm happy that there's choices for people. Um, I'm also hoping that they'll eventually consider working with the ROM cart makers on selling just the ROM of this game. Because I am one of those people that just prefers to have everything on my SD card while supporting the developers. I certainly don't want to try to get this for free. I really do just want to have everything on one cart to make things easier for me. So either way, if you're even remotely interested in getting a new Neo Geo shooter, it's worth at least watching the video and reading through the Kickstarter to see if it's for you. Uh, it looks pretty awesome, and I'm certainly looking forward to giving it a try whenever it's released. Someone has been posting videos about a Burning Rangers fan remake, and it looks pretty incredible. Uh, the gameplay and the way the movement looks on screen seems like a perfect tribute to the original, but there isn't really much information out there on it. So I'm not sure if this is something that's in progress. Maybe it's something somebody was doing for fun and hope Sega will pick up on it. But if anybody has any info on this, please post below. And if not, just uh, enjoy the pretty neat fan video that somebody made about it. 
Last week, Tim Worthington stopped by my apartment while he was in New York City, and we were able to sit down for a few drinks and do an interview, and it was just absolutely awesome hearing directly from the person who made some products that have changed many of the ways that we play retro video games. For me personally, I think the the biggest impact was the NES RGB. Uh, that mixed with the awesome color palettes that members of the community like Firebrand X and Naked Arthur had worked on really changed the way I played NES games. And it was just a, a pretty big deal for me and pretty much everybody else in the retro gaming scene when that was released. So it was really awesome to sit down and talk to him. Uh, he was very chill to hang out with. I had an absolutely great time. So hopefully you would all enjoy the interview as well. As always, it's available both as a video, and this one came out pretty good, uh, and just an audio-only podcast for people that prefer just listening on the go. All of these interviews are on all of the major uh, podcast services like iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and recently Spotify, as well as just an MP3 is available for people that just want to download that and listen or, or stream or whatever. So uh, thanks so much to Tim for stopping by and taking the time to do that. Hopefully everybody enjoyed it. Extremes has just released a new version of the Game Boy interface software that had a ton of bug fixes and additions since the last update. Uh, a bunch of cool features, including support for the new SD to SP2, that's the micro SD reader that plugs into the bottom of the GameCube that I talked about a few weeks ago. So overall, if you're like me and you're a big fan of the software, every time this uh, there's a new version released, I just dump the latest files on my SD card. I always go and check make, uh, to make sure I'm using the latest version version of Swiss as well, because I'm a huge fan of that, and uh, and just kind of go from there. If you don't know what the Game Boy interface is, the short, short version uh, is, you know, the Game Boy Player Kit for the GameCube that allows you to play Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance games. Well, this is a software replacement for that boot disk. So, of course, you still need the hardware, but the boot disk replaces the original and is better in absolutely every way possible. So, as long as you have a way to boot homebrew, I strongly recommend using Swiss and the Game Boy interface software. Inside Gadgets has just released a VGA out kit for the Game Boy Advance that does a 3x scaling via an 800x600 output. The original refresh rate of 59.7 Hz is retained, so this is probably something that's going to be much more compatible on CRT monitors versus flat screens, uh, but it's also fairly inexpensive. I believe the whole kit is going to be sold for around $70, so it makes it a pretty neat way to play Game Boy Advance if you were looking to play on a CRT monitor. Uh, as always, I love choices, so I'm sure there's people out there right now going, oh, this is the perfect choice for my setup. So uh, it's very cool that people are still showing the Game Boy Advance some love, even with the other products out there. So uh, hopefully I'll be able to take a look at one sometime and give it a full review, but it's uh, pretty cool. VGA out for the Game Boy Advance. It looks like Loic Petit has been continuing his work on reverse engineering the CPS2. That's the Capcord, Capcom play system that has a whole bunch of games on it that are arcade-based. Um, and it looks like he's trying to create full schematics both for repair and FPGA use. So um, there's a lot of a, a ton of details in his GitHub about this, and I'm a little late in reporting on it because I thought that's what this was, but I didn't want to to put a post up and get it wrong. So I, I waited for Smoke Monster to be able to to re-explain this to me to make sure. But this is pretty badass. It's a full reverse engineering product that's really going to help with repairs, uh, preservation, because you know you got to drop the p word nowadays whenever there's something like this. Uh, but also, I mean, I think this could assist people that are looking to do FPGA recreations of it as well. There's still a tremendous amount of work that goes into that, but having schematics like this posted are, are pretty awesome. So thank you very much, Louis, for all your work. Uh, we, we all appreciate it, whether it's your lag testing or this stuff. Uh, even if we don't know it, we, we really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Here's some good news for Atari 5200 fans. Someone has just created a completely custom controller that's built from scratch from all new parts, so no old controllers are cannibalized in this. And it looks pretty comfortable, and it looks like something I would enjoy using. So while I don't have much experience with the 5200, this looks like a pretty cool project. Um, I believe this is the same person that did the 5200 to PS2 adapters last year. Uh, and if you'd like, you could purchase this 
in any form that you'd like. So you could either get just the unpopulated circuit boards uh, for you to make your own, um, and that would be about $10. You can get the empty 3D printed shells, which are um, a little more expensive. And then, of course, if you wanted full controllers, you could buy those for 100 bucks each. So, you know, as somebody without too much experience in the 5200, the only thing that I know for sure is that the controllers that I've used in the past uh, when they worked, I thought were pretty cool, but they were very often broken. So I think this looks like something I would enjoy using more than that. Obviously, I you know I'm not a huge, uh, I don't have a bunch of experience with this, so I don't, I can't really say. But I don't know. This looks really cool. It certainly caught my eye when I saw the picture. So if you're into the 5200, definitely check out the post. And thanks very much to the Genovi for writing it up. I just uploaded what I would call a beginner video about the Rad 2X's Genesis 2 cable, because I'm really always trying to expand what it is that retro RGB does. And I think we're pretty much down the middle for intermediate stuff and sometimes touch upon the more advanced things like oscilloscope use and digging into schematics and stuff like that. But I haven't spent as much time as I would have wanted to on beginner stuff, selfishly, because I get sucked into the other things. But I think a huge problem in retro gaming is that there are so many more people that want to join, but it's just so intimidating when you're starting out. And a lot of people don't have the time, even if they're more than smart enough, they just don't have the hours to dedicate. So I really think the Rad 2X is a huge stepping stone because it's the first time anybody has ever had something that could just plug in and work. No ifs, ands, or buts, no like you know, no, well, you need this, but it might not work on that. You just plug it in. So when I did the original Rad 2X video, um, I tried to cover all grounds, but it was a long and confusing video for beginners. So some of the questions I got in the comments were things like, will it work with the 32X? Do I need adapters if I use it on like a CDX or something? And those are all good questions, especially for people just trying to get into this stuff. So I wanted to cover all of the basics, as well as throw in some of the tips that I always used to, uh, I always like to add to things like this. Things like if you're going to be using it on multiple consoles, uh, maybe use adapters instead of buying a Genesis 1 and a Genesis 2, just little things like that. And I also wanted to drive the point home that... Um, and I hope I didn't confuse anybody in this, and I hope this doesn't trigger any of my uh, my fellow extreme RGB nerds here, but for people just starting out, starting out with a 480p solution is much easier in most scenarios because it's sharp enough where it doesn't look weird, but it's soft enough where you don't get everything else amplified with the signal. Because don't forget, when you integer scale something, you are scaling all of that signal, including the noise and the jail bars. So one of the biggest problems when people decide to use an OSSC is they'll plug in their Super Nintendo and it'll look amazing and plug in their PlayStation and it looks great. And then they plug in their original Model 1 Genesis and go, why does it look like that? So this is just one more cool byproduct of the fact that it's only 480p and that you don't really notice the jail bars on your average screen. Um, so, I mean, obviously that means it's not as sharp, but for somebody beginning, it doesn't matter. So, you know, stuff like this, I, I hope, I hope even the experts and the intermediates, if you're willing to sit through an eight minute video on beginner stuff, I hope you could at least learn better ways to explain to beginners coming in. Cause I've worked so hard on that. I was never great at it. I'm getting better, but little things like it doesn't have to be a 20 minute conversation anymore. Start with this cable. It's the best for now. Who knows what's coming out next year, but just plug this sucker in and don't worry about anything else. And I'm going to be concentrating uh, at least once a week. I'm hoping for the next few, uh, for the next few weeks on these. So I could do like one rad two X video a week just to help beginners get started out with this stuff. Um, you know, in full disclosure too, I'm, I'm friends with Mike, uh, Mike Chi from retro tank and Rob from retro gaming cables. But, um, I would be equally as excited about this product if anybody made it. It's just that nobody has, and not only has nobody made one, they've gone the opposite. There's the absolute garbage that Pound put out, knowing that it's a piece of crap and not caring. So it's it's really twofold. And not only do we have a good option, I have to fight through all of the people trying to sell their crap options as well. So I really do want to put some focus on this uh, to get as many newcomers into the scene as we can, because there's just too much cool stuff that so many people want to experience and they have no way to really get started. So 
Uh, I guess I rambled way too long on a, on a beginner video that probably doesn't apply to some people listening anyway, but hopefully it's at least mildly entertaining and you could show it to your beginner friends and get them on board with retro gaming stuff. But as always, any, any feedback, I am all ears. Any ways to explain it better for beginners? Any thoughts on things like that? Any, any stuff that I missed that would only be relevant to beginners? None of this semantic stuff where, you know, I get three little details wrong that nobody cares about. Like, good feedback is always a pre uh, really appreciated so uh, who knows hopefully this will open up doors and we'll get more people into the gaming scene but anyway check it out and let me know what you think well that's it for this week as always thanks so much to everybody who listens watches and participates in the comments and of course thank you so much to all the supporters who keep this channel the weekly podcast and of course all of the ridiculous behind the scenes testing and stuff going because without you none of it would happen so thank you all so much and i'll see you next week